Welcome. My name is Mark Smith, and I have the pleasure today of talking with Chris Muma, one of the nation's true experts in the field of actual innocence and wrongful convictions. Uh, Chris is in North Carolina, her home base, but she is known around the country. Chris, welcome. Would you take just a minute and tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this subject of actual innocence and wrongful convictions? Sure. Thank, thank you for having me. And uh, really a pleasure to talk to people about these issues because I think it's so important for people to understand what's happening around them, not just on the TV shows they're watching all the time. Um, but I actually had no expectation when I went to law school that I would work in this area at all. Um, I had 10 years in corporate finance before going to law school, went to law school thinking I would do corporate law, um, then ended up clerking at the Supreme Court in North Carolina. And it was there that I got my first view of uh, the fallibility of our justice system. And uh, it's a human system and humans get things wrong. And um, so I, I, I'm fascinated with, pro I'm, I'm a big problem solver. So um, I saw that there were problems to be solved and that's really what got me interested. Uh, in addition to having a criminal law professor in law school, Rich Rosen, who represented Ronald Cotton, who was one of the, the was the first exoneration case in North Carolina. So I had a mentor and then direct exposure to the issues that got me interested. Now you have been involved in a number of the high profile cases of exoneration. And the subject that we're going to talk about today is, is one of that, that is too often found in cases of wrongful convictions. And that is uh, the use of jailhouse informants who provide information that is in fact not reliable. Um, we thought we would introduce the subject by referring to two particular cases, Chris, that you've worked with, Greg Taylor and Joseph Sledge. Um, would you start with one of those and, and give us a little background on the case and then talk about how the issue of uh, jailhouse informants played a role in the wrongful conviction? Over the course of these different sessions that we're doing, we're learning that there are a variety of different reasons why wrongful convictions occur, and oftentimes more than one happens in the same case, and we'll see some of that here too. Absolutely. It's... it's uh... It's not very typical that you see just one causation issue. You, you have one causation issue that leads to a domino effect where the other ones come into play. And that's what happened in both of the cases that uh, I'm going to talk about today. Um, and, and you're correct that we, we see the same things over and over again in wrongful conviction cases. And um, we've addressed some of those around the country and internationally. Um, more commonly eyewitness identification and recording of interrogations. But the use of jailhouse informants is something that has not gotten very much attention so far and, and is kind of the up and coming issue in wrongful conviction cases. Um, and, and just like ID and, and interrogations that can lead to false confessions, in the use of jailhouse informants, even though there are reliability issues in using them, we're not gonna stop using them in the justice system, right? They are gonna be out there. Um, law enforcement is gonna to want to use any information they can get access to. So the question is, is always, if we have to have these things in our justice system, then how can we increase the reliability as much as possible so that we can decrease the chances that somebody is wrongfully convicted the victim doesn't get true justice, the true perpetrator doesn't get true justice. And then of course the innocent person is in prison for a crime they didn't commit, which in my mind, as hard as I try to think of something that's worse than that, I can't come up with anything that's worse than spending the rest of your life in prison for a crime you didn't commit. And, and that's what almost happened in both of these cases. Um, did you want to comment, Mark, before? Okay. As we get started with this, would you provide a definition of what's meant by a jailhouse informant? Sure. So there are different types of informants. So it's really important to clarify what a jailhouse informant is 
versus other types of informants. You can have a confidential informant. You can have an informant who's on the street. You can have a co-defendant who's a an informant. A jailhouse informant is a very specific type of informant. And that is a person who is in custody, who could not have been present at the time of the crime, who um, learns information directly from the person who is the suspect in the crime, supposedly learns information uh, while they're in custody. So someone's arrested, they're in jail with someone or in prison with someone, and they come forward or they're approached by law enforcement. And um, they say they have information about what the suspect or the defendant um, has said during their incarceration to implicate themselves in the crime. Um, so, and in, in typically, so, sometimes uh, it, we, we know in advance that the person is, is asking for a benefit to share this information. Uh, they may ask for a reduced sentence, they may ask for a drop charge, they may ask to be located in a prison in a specific location. But um, sometimes, which is, is where we really need to be careful, they are incentivized to give this information against a suspect or a defendant. And that was the case um, in both of the cases that I'm gonna tell you about. Um, one, which was uh, happened the longest time ago, and, and people like to say, well, these were all things that happened a long time ago, and, and it's not. It's happened, it's happened for a long time, but it still happens. And um, this case is Joseph Sledge, um, who is one of our clients who spent 36 years in prison for a double murder he did not commit. Um, it's the murder of a mother and her daughter, and the daughter was raped. Um, both the victims were white. Uh, Joseph was black. And uh, when the, the law enforcement investigated the crime scene, they found black hairs, African-American hairs on the daughter who was raped. And it was in the seventies. So the best they could say was, well, there's some consistency in these hairs from the, the victims, uh, the hairs collected from the victim compared to Joseph Sledge's hairs. Um, so they didn't say they were matched. They say they were consistent. And in Joseph's case, it, it, as in we, what we see in other cases is this jailhouse informant testimony evidence is used kind of as a closer um, when the prosecutor can't quite get past that reasonable doubt and they, they need just a little bit more evidence to kind of secure the conviction is when we sometimes see them, them looking for these jailhouse informants. And that's what happened in Joseph Sledge's case. The evidence was weak. Um, so they went to the prison where Joseph had been held and they asked who he associated with and they identified two men and both of those men, one of them came forward pretty quickly with the story about Joseph admitting to the murders. Um, the other one we learned later, first said he never heard of Joe say anything then he comes back a second interview and says, well, let me think about it a little longer. Maybe I'll think of something. And there's actually several interviews before in the fourth interview, he says something that implicates Joe and then testifies to that at trial. So Joseph was convicted based on some very weak physical evidence, uh, proximity to the crime scene and the statements by these two jailhouse informants. And it wasn't- Chris, why was he arrested in the first place? Uh, he, was, he was arrested. Uh, he was serving a, a sentence for stealing some t-shirts. Um, and he was serving a, a four year sentence and he was attacked at prison, um, in prison while he, for stealing the t-shirts by um, another inmate. And he feared for his life and escaped. Now, that sounds like a, a horrible thing, but there were 14 escapes from this prison uh, that year. So the, the prison was uh, not very secure. And, and Joe tells the story of how he was sitting by the fence and he saw some uh, scuppernog 
uh, grapes on the other side of the fence and he was worried about this other inmate and he got on the other side of the fence to get to the grapes and then decided this was a good opportunity to protect himself as well and he escaped. So he was an escaped inmate um, and there was a murder, this murder happened a couple miles away. So there's no question it was reasonable to suspect Joe, to put him in the pool of suspects. Um, but as in, we see in other cases, he was the only suspect. Um, they had a murder, they had this escaped inmate and they just decided, although he didn't have any kind of violent history whatsoever, that he was the one that had murdered these women and he became their so sole focus. Um, where, so we see tunnel vision in the investigation where law enforcement just doesn't look at any other options um, and has tunnel vision in the analysis of the evidence, uh, the hair evidence. Um, we, we didn't learn until 2014 that there were actually bloody palm prints on the floor on either side of the victim's head. And they knew those palm prints did not match Joseph Sledge. Um, so it's a perfect example of tunnel vision where you discard the evidence that doesn't fit your theory of the case and you discount that evidence and you look for other evidence that shores up your theory. Um, so it was in 2014 that we learned about the bloody, bloody palm prints, um, that we learned um, that both of the jailhouse informants had been paid cash. Uh, we, had, we actually had the canceled checks. Um, and they were, in, in terms of valuation- paid, paid cash by the prosecution? They were paid cash by the state. Um, and in, in the equivalent of about $20,000. So it was not um, just, you know, small dollars, it was large dollars. Uh, and they had charges reduced and charges, sentences reduced and charges dropped. So they definitely had substantial benefit from giving this testimony. Um, one of the men passed away before uh, 2014 when we were able to get access to the files. Um, but, but one was living and we managed to find him and he immediately, when we found him, uh, came clean and said, it wasn't true what I said. They told me Joe did it and I would be helping people. Um, he never said anything to me. Um, and he ended up testifying at Joe's, uh, exoneration hearing where we presented his testimony as well as testing of all the hairs that have been found on the victim's body that were proven through DNA testing, not only to not match Joe, but to be from the same person and not match the victim. So it's definitely the perpetrator's hair. Uh, and uh, Joe was, was proven innocent and uh, after 36 years. Um, and it's a tragic story from beginning to end, um, full of racism and tunnel vision and um, junk science and, uh, you know, and then, and then the jailhouse informants were really the key piece of evidence against him. And there's even an additional chapter I know of uh, news that just from this week that uh, Mr. Sledge just recently died. He did after just five years of freedom. Uh, he struggled, you know, once you're in prison for 37 years, you're, you're very institutionalized. And it was always difficult for him to come back into the world that was so different than it was when he went in. We tried very hard to help him through that. Um, and it's, it's, it makes it even sadder that the evidence that, that proved his innocence was available 12 years prior to his exoneration. Um, it was asked for 12 years prior to his exoneration, and it, we were told it was it was lost or destroyed. Um, so it, it's I'm you know people say be thankful he had the five years of freedom, but he he should have had those additional 12 in addition to never having been convicted in the first place. So we'll miss him very much. Thank you for your good work on his behalf. Greg Taylor is another person that you've spent a lot of time working on behalf of and uh, with some similar issues. Could you tell us about that one too? 
Yes, so uh, Greg Taylor, Taylor's case is uh, another murder case um, and from Wake County, North Carolina. It happened in the 90s, so now we're 20 years after Joseph Sledge's case. And um, uh, Greg had a co-defendant, Johnny Beck. Um, they were in the vicinity. Again, you have proximity uh, where they're close to, the, to where the body is found. Greg's truck was actually found stuck in the mud um, just 100 yards from where the victim's body was, was found that morning. So they had the victim's body and they had this truck stuck in the mud and they just draw you know, the, the conclusion that these are connected. And, and again, Greg was, was someone they should look at. They should definitely look at the owner of the truck, but they never did any investigation beyond Greg. Uh, the truck was was uh, found at 7.30 in the mar morning. The victim was found at 7.30 in the morning. The truck was found just about the same time. Uh, Greg came downtown to get his truck about 9 o'clock in the morning, and they asked him to come downtown and answer some questions, and he never went home again. So he and Johnny were both arrested that very morning, and as far as the, the law enforcement was concerned, the case was closed. Um, they tried to turn Johnny and Greg against each other, uh, which we see a lot in these cases as well. And I've always said, you know, if two people actually committed a murder together and they're told, listen, if you'll turn on the other one, you can go home. Um, both of them are going to be fighting to get that deal because <laughs> they know they're guilty and they know they have a way to get home. But when you have two people who are supposed to be together and are offered this opportunity and they both say, no, no, I know that other person is innocent because I was with them. And so there's no way they can be guilty. Um, that should give you pause. Uh, and that's what happened in this case. Um, they tried to turn each other, them against each other, more so Greg against Johnny because we see race in this case as well. Johnny's black, Greg is white. Uh, there's a, a black victim. And, um, and they had their eyes on Johnny because he was identified as somebody who sold drugs on the street. And so they really were giving Greg the opportunity to turn against Johnny. Um, and they're just not, there was not any physical evidence at all in the case. Although it was a very bloody crime scene and a very, very brutal murder, there was no transfer of evidence between the victim and Johnny and Greg or Johnny and Greg and the victim. Uh, there were no fingerprints from the victim in the truck. Um, they had uh, one small spot of a red substance on the fender of Greg's car that they presented to the jury as being the victim's blood. And that's, a, that's another part of Greg's case. So they used that physical evidence of that one spot of what they said was the victim's blood. And then they had a jailhouse informant in Ernest Andrews. Uh, Ernest had been in jail. Uh, he was in jail at the same time as Greg. And he reached out to law enforcement and said he had information and said he would provide the information if they would um, reduce his sentence. And he ended up testifying against Greg that Greg had admitted to the murder while they were in jail. Um, actually, had Greg had said that Johnny was the one that chased her down and murdered her, but that he had been there when it happened. Um, so that drop of red substance and Ernest Andrews testimony uh, and actually another street informant's testimony uh, was what was presented at trial and convicted Greg Taylor. Um, when he was in his, his early 30s, he had an eight-year-old daughter. Um, he was married to his high school sweetheart. Uh, he's not the person you normally think of in a wrongful conviction case. He could, he could be my brother. He could be my uncle. He could, you know, be my, my high school friend. Um, he had a house and two cars and a dog and a cat and a boat. Um, so very suburban type of, of life. Um, but he was doing he was doing drugs with Johnny Beck and that put him, as we say, uh, there's unforeseen consequences to the things you do. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, 
doing the wrong thing, you can be blamed for things that are much, much worse uh, just because of where you are. Um, and so Greg was convicted and uh, sentenced to life in prison. Um, and uh, 17 years later, uh, we were uh, able to prove his innocence primarily because it was proven that that red spot on the truck uh, in fact, was not the victim's blood. Uh, in fact, it was not even human blood. So this was a forensic science um, uh, issue. But once you prove that someone is innocent, then you look at all the things that contributed to their wrongful conviction, and there's Ernest Andrews. And you go back and you look at Ernest Andrews, and at the time they put him on the stand to be the testimony that made the difference between Greg going to trial and being sentenced to life and Johnny Beck's charges being dismissed. That was the only piece of evidence that was different between the two cases. Um, and Ernest had charges for fraud. He had charges for embezzlement. He had armed robbery charges. He had a, a history of dishonesty. And, and this was the person the state was willing to use to put someone away for the rest of their life. Um, so Johnny was never convicted. His charges were dismissed. And on the dismissal, it says, there is no jailhouse informant in this case as there was in the co-defendant's case. Um, and because they convicted Greg and were not able to take Johnny to trial, they continuously went to Greg after he was convicted, before he was sentenced, after he was in prison for years, and tried to convince him to just testify against Johnny Beck and he could go home. Uh, and he has such integrity and character, uh, despite getting his wife divorcing him and not seeing his daughter for years and being incarcerated, he refused to let go of the truth. Um, felt that was the only thing he had left was the truth. And he refused to testify against Johnny and was eventually completely exonerated and pardoned by the governor. So very sad stories that um, have some reliability standards been put in place to, to ensure that those statements were reliable, um, they would never have been used to convict either Greg or John or, or Joseph. That's really the next question. <clears throat> You've seen it when things go wrong. If you had a chance to fix the system, to make it better, what kind of changes would you put in place, Chris? So we're seeing some changes across the country. There are currently eight states that have um, put into place varying levels of reliability standards, some much stronger than others. We're also seeing some counties. There's a couple counties in, in your state, uh, Dallas and Tarrant County, who have put some um, protections in place. Uh, the Attorney General of New Jersey has issued guidelines. So it is, this is all something that's happening more recently. What kind and, of guidelines are we talking about? What's that? What kind of guidelines are these? So, so the guidelines, um, they vary, right? So sometimes you can have baby steps and sometimes you can have bigger steps. So uh, I'm gonna talk about what I think are the most important uh, standards to put in place. And then there's the wish list. Um, I think for anything in the justice system, uh, transparency and disclosure uh, are key. So just as with recording of interrogations, we want to see what's happening behind that closed door when someone uh, not only is being interrogated, but interviewed. Um, a recording of jailhouse informant statements, I think, is a critical reform that should be put in place. And particularly now when the, the cost of storage is recording is, is, is minimal, and now we have body cams, and we have cameras in the jails, and we have cameras in the interrogation rooms, and we have cameras on our cell phones, and it's just so easy to record now. There's no reason not to. Uh, and particularly for a jailhouse informant because they're already in custody. So you can control the timing of when that interview happens and make sure you have the equipment available to record. The importance of recording is so that 
one, it can be provided to the defense and you get the informant's own words. Um, you, you make sure that what they're saying is not being corrected by somebody with good intentions or bad intentions. Um, you can compare what they're saying to what's been shown on the news and what's been in the newspaper to ensure that this is informa information that um, they would not have access to otherwise. Um, so it's an important piece for the defense and it's an important piece to reduce uh, prosecution challenges. Um, so I would say recording is my first wish um, and that is actually not something that has, is being done anywhere to my knowledge, but I think it is something that should be a priority um, everywhere. The other things that are um, being proposed um, uh, jury instructions. So we have jury instructions uh, can be used to tell the jury, you know, this testimony has a little bit more risk to it, um, such as when a co-defendant testifies in return for a reduced uh, sentence or charge. And so you want to tell the jury, you need to consider that when you're thinking about the reliability or the credibility of that testimony. Jury instructions can also be given with jailhouse informants to say, you need to, to take this, this testimony and put it under a slightly different light than you might other testimony, because this person may have incentive to give the statements that they're giving. So that's a, a very easy change to make and does not have any costs associated with it. Um, another change is pre-trial uh, reliability, credibility hearing with the judge. So in other cases, sometimes with um, medical testimony, sometimes with child testimony, with any testimony where there might be a question uh, of evaluating the evidence before it's heard by the jury, the judge hears the evidence. And the judge, with all of their experience, can make a determination uh, whether that, uh, that testimony should be heard by the jury. So in these hearings, uh, pre-trial hearings, the judge is evaluating the criminal history of the informant, uh, the information they're provided. How many times have they provided information? Sometimes we see these serial informants where they have the power of a priest uh, and, and they're able to get everybody to confess to them just magically uh, by, um, they're just so compelling with their uh, getting people to open up to them. So how many times has this person given testimony as jailhouse informant? Have they ever recanted uh, a prior, in a, a testimony they've given in a prior case? Um, so all of this information can be given to the judge for his evaluation. Um, it, and so even if you don't have the, the judge evaluating that evidence, when I talk about transparency and disclosure, a very important component is the prosecution sharing all that information with the defense. So uh, making sure the defense has full access to the record, who's being used as a jailhouse informant, what they said, when it was said, and then it's up to the defense attorney to do their job and investigate that person and investigate the content of the statement and be prepared to challenge that at the time of trial so the jury sees both sides of the argument about whether this person's testimony should be believed or not. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna look at my notes here. Um, the, a couple of the things that I think that are, that are very uh, easy to do and very critical, um, one is approval of the supervising district attorney. So sometimes you have assistant district attorneys who make the decision to use a jailhouse informant. And we first saw this in Canada. Uh, Canada actually established a, um, a commission for, for all of Canada where they would track and approve the use of all jailhouse informants. And, but so there's, this, there's a, a, a need for ownership, right? The ownership, the elected DA or the appointed DA, whatever your process your state has 
should be the one who's approving the use of the jailhouse testimony because it there are reliability issues. So that's an, that's again should be an easy thing to do without much cost involved, and um, that district attorney should own uh, that testimony that's being given in his jurisdiction. Um, the other is victim notification, and a lot of times we talk about notification of victims in um, when it comes to the victims of the crime that person is being prosecuted for. But in this case, we're talking about the victim of the crime the jailhouse informant's being prosecuted for. So that victim needs to be aware if that jailhouse informant is being given a reduced sentence or a drop charge or some type of deal for their testimony because it impacts that victim. So um, we, we, we need to think more broadly about victim impact when these people are used, their testimony is used and uh, incentives are given to them. And then the, the final, um, there's, I'm sure there's more, but the one other recommendation that is being implemented is tracking. Um, so a statewide, uh, at, at a minimum, statewide tracking um, that counties sh can share with each other um, because there's often these people who are serial informants. So we want to have tracking to say, when is a jailhouse informant used? And um, do that, did they ever recant? And uh, are, they are they convicted of a felony after that? Um, and that tracking um, should be care shared between counties to make sure the same person is not popping up in case after case after case. So, None of those um, standards or, or uh, reforms are expensive. They're, you know, the tracking uh, for the counties that are doing it or the states that are doing it, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so it's not very difficult to put in place. Um, Is it, so, are you finding difficulty getting those reforms accomplished, Chris? Is it a matter of just a a bulky system that doesn't respond very quickly or is there opposition to particular suggestions that are being made? There's tremendous opposition in this area, um, much more so than I've seen in any of the other reforms uh, that we've worked on. But I think the reason for that is, is I mean, you, we get the, the same pushback, you know, the cost and, um, we get statements that jailhouse informants really aren't used anymore and we have tracking to show that that's not true. Um, and so really it, it becomes about educating law enforcement and prosecution about the benefits to them of, of putting these reforms in place. And it's similar to recording interrogations. And, and as you know, the benefits for recording interrogations for prosecution and law enforcement greatly outnumber the benefits for defense, right? That a lot of defense attorneys don't like that stuff to be on tape. Um, but um, you can tell how old I am when I use the word tape. Uh, <laughs> so um, so there's, a, there's a tremendous benefits in public confidence, decreased challenges, reliability of convictions, um, this is, a, this is another topic where it should be supported, whether you're a defense attorney or a prosecutor, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, um, everybody wants justice. This is something that increases justice. Uh, so it's just a matter of educating people. And I think um, bringing people to the table to discuss what can be done and the consequences of not having reform and, and having and, and allowing people to each have a voice. Um, if, if you take a reform out without having the voice of the other side, you're going to get opposition. But if you can bring people to the table first to talk about it, uh, typically that moves the reform um, ahead much faster. Chris, you've been working in this field tirelessly for many years and We've seen changes happen. Um, it used to be 
not too many years ago, the gold standard in the courtroom was eyewitness testimony. If you went into the court and you said, I saw somebody do that, that was uh, um, treated as, as pretty powerful evidence. Now we know that, that there are problems with eyewitness testimony. We know there are problems with other kinds of testimony, with forensics. Are we doing a better job now? Are we learning lessons from this history that you've had um, do you have more faith in the justice system now than the way that system operated 10 or 15 years ago? How much farther do we still have to go? Uh, yeah, I absolutely have more faith. I, th I think um, investigative procedures have changed so much and we have the benefit of DNA testing now. I, th I think it is an interesting fact that um, approximately 25% of suspects um, are eliminated through pretrial DNA testing. So that means when we didn't have DNA testing, those people were probably were gonna go to trial. And with the very high conviction rates, if you go to trial uh, or the amount of pressure you get to plead, plead guilty before going to trial, with, because we only have about 5% of cases that, that actually go to trial. A lot of the 25% the of people who've been who are now eliminated likely would have been convicted. So I think that's a really important statistic and how much things have changed. Um, I think it's also a generational, uh, the generation that is coming up as, as the up and coming prosecutors, um, even the up and coming defense attorneys um, have more exposure to wrongful convictions. Uh, they've heard the stories over the last 20 years where the people who were in higher positions previously did not come up with that same exposure. So I think the process has changed. Um, I do think obviously it's still a human system and human error exists and we're not going to eliminate it completely. And there's always bad apples. So, um, you know, you have human fallibilities. So if there's reliability standards you can put in place to increase reliability, there's really no rational reason when you look into all the costs and, uh, and all the other things that are brought up in opposition, uh, there's really no rational reason not to put these reforms in place, at least some of them to increase reliability. Um, I like to think that the number of applications, I've been doing this for 20 years. And when I first started, um, we were getting 12 to 1500 applications a year. And we currently get about 600 applications a year. So um, I think- uh, Claims of actual innocence. Uh, claims of actual innocence. So um, I think that's an indicator that the reliability is, is is increasing, um, but uh, there's a lot of older cases out there, and the older cases are where you you really meet a lot of the opposition. Um, it's surprising. It's not. Sometimes you might think, well, this wasn't the prosecutor who prosecuted the case, so they're not going to push back as much. But I think the pushback is is harder, uh, and and more often now than it was 20 years ago. Hmm. Um, and, I, and I actually think that's because of the civil litigation. Now we've had so many, the, the counties or the cities or the states have had the financial consequences associated with the wrongful conviction. And um, we've, we've lost the message of what this is, is about. It's about justice, um, it's about justice for the victim. It's about justice for the perpet true perpetrator, justice for the person who's in prison. And when, when money uh, muddies the water on uh, efforts to reach justice, that's when you have true injustice. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing more of. Chris, thank you very much. Um, I mean, what we're trying to do with this series is to give people who aren't as intimately involved in the justice system uh, insights though, that they can have a better sense of, of what the, the, the problems are in the justice system, how those problems might be addressed, how we can seek to put in place a, a, a 
fairer and more effective justice system. And, um, and we appreciate the opportunity to learn from your wealth of experience. And thank you very, very much. Well, I think it's a great thing you're doing. I think, uh, you know, the people who hopefully who are going to listen to this are going to include our future prosecutors and our future defense attorneys. So it's important for them to have this information uh, as they go through their careers. 